Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the second afternoon speech for, for today, talker, speaker for today. Um, we have Jerry Hubbell from Explore Scientific. Uh, Jerry was a nuclear engineer, and I guess once a nuclear engineer, always a nuclear engineer. And after that career, he became the chief engineer for Explore Scientific. Um, Explore has developed an open source uh, control system for telescopes and uh, accessories. And Jerry's going to speak to us today about that and how people can participate in open source for astronomical software. So please welcome Jerry Hubble. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate that. I, I always, uh, this is the second year I've been here. Last year I gave a talk about our observatory that we built, uh, Mark Slater Remote Observatory. And then Alan asked me again to talk this year, so I appreciate that very much. And uh, so you see my booth out here. Uh, I've been able to talk to a lot of folks t this weekend. Uh, the rain is unfortunate, but it's been pretty good for us. Uh, so what I came to talk about uh, this weekend is our control system that, we, that we've that we been developing for the last, actually since uh, 2014. And we finally uh, released it for sale in uh, about a year and a half ago, beginning of uh, 17. So what I'm going to talk about is basically some of the background on the system, how we uh, are planning on, uh, how we support it and how we plan on supporting it into the future um, for, our, uh, for our customers. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I am the, I'm the Director of Electrical Engineering for Explore Scientific. I'm the primary uh, principal engineer for the system. I've, I've got 35 years experience in the nuclear industry, instrumentation and controls. So this is a great opportunity for me when Scott hired me to, uh, to continue work in the electronics area and enjoy my hobby at the same time. So that's a great, great feature. And uh, so I do a couple other things. I, I'm uh, on the staff of the uh, ALPO. I'm assistant coordinator for lunar topographical studies, and uh, I authored these two books, uh, which are going to be, I think, one a copy of each are going to be given away as a door prize today. And I've also got one left. I brought a couple more, and I've got one left for sale if anybody's interested in it. Uh, the second book there, the Ruined Observatory book. Um, so this is last year. That's the booth I had set up. And if I th some of you may recall what happened, this is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I didn't get it back to this state. I just, I just, I didn't put another picture. So I opened. I basically set up my table the next day on Sunday, and had it open without the tent. And it was, it was good that day. It didn't rain anymore. So, what I'm going to talk about <coughs> are our product design goals. We have a philosophy for our products. Uh, also, what the vision behind the PMC-8 system was when Scott approached me to build the system. And then the design philosophy, the system architecture, and then we'll talk about uh, a program that we're s we set up called the Open Go To Community. Uh, we'll talk about that and how that relates to the PMC-8 system and how uh, everybody can get involved with this system. Um, all right, so our design goals you know, we're first and foremost customer focused. So we want to make it as easy and for customers to get into the astronomy uh, hobby and uh, be as cost effective as we can. So we're, we consider ourselves a pretty high value company. We, we give you very good, you know, good to excellent performance for about half the cost is what we'd like to say. Um, and so, and we want our equipment to disappear. We don't want you to have to mess with it while you're doing your observing. You don't want to continue to have to mess with your mount or your scope or your focuser or whatever and tweak it and tune it and do all that stuff. Now, that's not to say you won't have to do that to learn the system and to understand how it works, but once you get it working like you want, we want it to just disappear. Um, so that's kind of what our philosophy is. Uh, so Scott, first uh, approached me about this system back in 2013 and uh, he wanted to be able to d have a design that's built in the US 
and uh, and designed in the U.S. and we have complete control over all the documentation, all the design, everything here. And as an adjunct to that, he proposed that we make it open source, all the code that we can open source. That doesn't include the firmware because that's basically the keys to the kingdom with the system, of course, <laughs> you know, but, but everything else is open. The control language, the source code for our ASCOM driver, we're, we're getting our, we have an application called Explore Stars that we're uh, going to make open source and share all the code for that. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit uh, later. So that's the that's Scott's side of it. He wanted a control system that we could share with everybody and that would be flexible that way. So my what I brought to the table, I thought we should design this system a little different than most control systems that are used uh, today with a hand controller um, paradigm where you have all the astronomy functions, all the database and everything in your hand controller. We basically have abstracted out all the astronomy centric uh, things in the controller and it's so it's just a pure motion controller. And then you abstract it out into the application and driver level. So you basically make a high performance controller that you layer on top of all the advanced functions that you want outside so it's easier to update easier to keep up, you know, current. Um, so that's that was a philosophy I brought to the thing. Plus, I was used to industrial design uh, and, and nuclear-rated instrumentation, so I knew I wanted to bring that kind of reliability and performance. And that was Scott's main goal, is to build a high, reliable system uh, that, uh, that, we could t that we could do at an affordable cost. So the result is the PMC-8. And it's designed for a very long life cycle. I would say up to 20 years, I would like to see this uh, design live. And, um, and I know the, the components are, are basically current state-of-the-art components that are available today. They're not bleeding edge. They're really robust, proven equipment that's, that's, uh, that's good for the next 20 years. Um, So this is the timeline. We started in 2013. I proposed the architecture in March of 13. At that time, I was working full-time for the nuclear industry. And uh, I started developing a prototype design in, in the sum summer of 13. Um, and then I started working in January of 14. I, I, I quit my job at the nuclear plant and started working for Scott in 14. Um, during the time in 13, I was a contractor, so I was working two jobs at once. It was just kind of a pain. It was good money, but it was just a lot of work. Um, so after that, in April 15, we had the first release of the design, the hardware. Uh, the prototype was, a, was first in 2015, and in 16, uh, I got the AS ASCOM driver built. Um, and then the, the last thing, it was ready in 2016 to sell, but we had to wait on six months for the FCC testing. That was a, a just a pain because they have to go uh, go to the factory, make sure it meets the requirements, go to, you know, make sure the testing is complete uh, for the emissions test and all that that's involved. This was the first product I had ever really designed in my career. And it was a learn big learning experience to go through that testing requirements. And our nuclear? No, it does, but I'm not, I wasn't the manufacturer then. I was just, the <laughs> I was the maintenance guy, you know. I was the engineer that, that spec that stuff. So I was familiar with the process because we, we actually did have to do uh, EMI, RFI testing in the plant. So I knew the test testing but I didn't I have I never built a product before to, to do that uh, so our first G11 was sold in February 17 and our XS2 mount uh, in, in April so here's an early uh, this is like the first m couple months I was prototyping the controller it's kind of cool to get all my you know get up to speed, get ramped up on all the equipment. Uh, I had to spec the chips and decide what, what uh, components I was going to use. And it was a, it was a great learning experience because I, I hadn't designed a hardware circuit for like 25 years. 
and when I started on this. And the technology that was available at that uh, today compared to what it was back then is just far and long. You know, it's a long ways apart. It's much. It's much fa easier in some regards. It's it's a little more. Uh, you know, for compared to the way we used to have to do it, you know, it's much easier today. There's so much documentation in the Internet. It just helps you. And examples and samples, I mean, you can, you know, grab circuits from everywhere, and they give you all kinds of stuff, so it's easier. Um, so the design philosophy is a simplified command language, and I got into this a little bit before where I talked about the standard hand controller um, all the astronomy functions are built in, all the database and everything. So in a typical hand controller, like a meter Celestron, you have well over 100, probably 150 different commands to the controller. And they're all cryptic, of course, you know. But they, and they also deal with um, uh, engineering units, which, which is like RA and DEC values directly. Uh, so... I basically abstracted all that stuff out, and the control, the PMC-8 has uh, 18, I think, 17, 18 commands. And they all deal with the motors. They don't have nothing to do with anything else, just the motors. And the motors are important. That's its defined function is to make sure you have very precise control of the motors and um, high reliability and function. Uh, and the way we do that... Um, I don't know if that's the next slide. So basically, when you have a command language that's only 18 commands versus 150-some commands, this is very easy to code to. It's very easy to develop applications to talk, that talk directly with the controller. Um, and, I, and like I said, the ASCOM driver is basically an a excellent source for how to do that, and that's open source. So it's very fast and easy to learn to commit to control and to uh, develop software for the system. All of those commands down to 18, uh, are any of those still available as functions of, uh, of growing benefits in the event of the uh, red boarding that exists for some other purpose? So the so that's a big part of the design philosophy. It's 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 I think I'm getting your your message. Um, those commands are fairly generic for a motor control system, which is a robot, a robot, right? So it's a basically a robotic controller. So this this box could be used for any kind of robot system, not just a mount. So that's the way those those commands are designed. Is that kind of what you're getting at? The limit switch, uh, the inputs, and, and, uh, right. Uh, there's no there's no feedback right now in the system like a, a high resolution encoder or anything. That, although it's it's set up for that. I've got I've got pins uh, assigned to that already, but the functionality has not been included in the firmware. But yeah, you can have feedback uh, incorporated into the design. That's the other thing about the design is it's been uh, it's really flexible. I, I tried to keep it to where um, the hardware is pretty well set. All you need to do is add firmware and, and connectors to add these other functions. Um, so yeah, so it's basically, you could turn this box right now into two axis robot controller and hopefully in the future we'll be able to, to sell uh, a chassis that has two, four, six, eight channels uh, as a full blown either observatory control system for for focusers and domes and anything else you want to put a motor on. Or you could say, no, this is going to be used for my control arm, my robotic arm to, to move, you know, a four-axis or six-axis robot uh, control arm to do whatever you want to do. So it's a it's basically a learning system for the, in that regard. And I'll get into it later, but we we're, that's part of this design philosophy for the system is to be able to start out with this mount controller but expand it out into a lot of other areas and continue to build it as a platform. Um, so, the Open Go To community, this is a summary, is basically our gateway to learning about the PMC-8, and it's meant to be a way to share all the information that we have about the PMC-8 system. 
And we do that a couple of uh, ways. Primarily, I, I started a Yahoo group last year that we just moved over to groups.io because Yahoo is getting to be really flaky. And so if you look up on groups.io, look up the PMC8, you'll find out our group. And that's that's the first thing I did uh, to get our, our customers involved and anybody else that's interested in the system. The other thing is uh, we've got an, a pretty extensive knowledge base I've been working on the last few months about that talks about all the different things you can do with the PMC-8 and what things you might run into. There's some videos that we've created. Um, we've also started in just July last month we had a uh, conference uh, open go to community conference at our headquarters in Arkansas and from that we created the uh, steering committee the open uh, go to community steering committee which is like a, a board that uh, we're, we're defining the infrastructure defining all the ways the policies we're going to use to to share our open source software right now when you load the ASCOM driver you uh, you can have a choice to download the source code. We're getting ready to share it actually on GitHub. That the source code for the ASCOM driver and also the uh, Explore Stars application. So that's the web-based social media and collaborative platforms that we're working on to get people that are interested involved with the system and to be able to share their their experience with the system. Um, all right, so this goes over a little bit more what I was saying. Uh, we wanted to build a modern state-of-the-art uh, control system that used uh, that uses advanced features. Um, and the initial design was to be able to was at the high end so that uh, we could use this system in an observatory, a professional observatory environment. In fact, uh, one of the things we're working on in Arkansas, they just uh, University of Arkansas just got a um, refractor from a college in Philadelphia, Swarthmore College, I think. I'm not sure, but they brought the ref it's a it's a Clark 26 inch refractor. I think that they're installing at the University of Arkansas, and Explore Scientific uh, helped uh, donated money to help bring that system down to Arkansas, and I think we're going to be installing our control system on it, the PMC8. So that's going to be pretty exciting to see that big refractor being controlled with this uh, system. Uh, so that's the level that we wanted to build this system initially was at that um, professional level. And you can see by the design that it's pretty robust. I mean, we've got this pretty good, you know, case. Um, it's got old style PB9 connectors on it for locking connectors. And, and it's pretty robust. Uh, for observatory use and then our goal once we got that is to push that technology down into the lower end which we did on the XS2 mount although it uses the same box it's much cheaper and then we're getting ready to release another mount where I've created a new version of this board that's much smaller that's going to go on a smaller uh, mount that's only $400 and it's completely um, auto guide capable got the full all the full firmware that's available on the high end system um it's just going to be uh pretty advanced for that smallest system you'll be able to do astrophotography with four hundred dollar mount and we've tested it uh the mechanics are of course the mechanicals aren't the best they're not the high end mechanicals but we were able to auto guide at a two arc second level r m s with this small mount which I think is pretty good. And you'll mount a th you know an 80 millimeter scope on it. It's only uh, I think it's 18 pounds. It's got an 18 pound payload on it. And it's a gym mount. It's a small gym. It's not a uh, like typically you find out as but it's a gym mount. So I think it's one of the first ones that I don't know what else is available out there in that size uh right now but so that's our goal is to take the technology at the high end and push it down to make it a high value proposition for the user. Um, and we want to make it easy. 
So that's what goes into our Explore Stars app. Is uh, uh, there's two levels of, to the Explore Stars app. One is a basic beginner level where we have a nice graphical interface where you can see the object, what it looks like in a photograph, not in your eyepiece <laughs> per se. <laughs> Because people get confused sometimes when they see beginners, when they see these deep sky objects, you know, they look real bright and they don't understand that they're photographs. So you use that interface to get to the object and then it goes to the object and a uh, really simple, you know, one click type thing. Uh, so the system architecture, this is uh, like one of the keys to its reliability and its, and its, uh, and its high, high performances. We use a processor that's got, it's an eight, eight processor microcontroller. So it's got eight parallel processors um, that, that really allow it to be very responsive, very reliable. Um, and we've got, I've got the tasks uh, shared. Four of the processors are dedicated directly to the motors. And then you've got the command processor, uh, the interpreter, and you've got a serial port management processor, and you've got um, another watchdog timer that watches the system. And all these processes run independently of each other, and but they share memory space, so you can trans, you know, share data between the processes. Uh, so that's how it works, um, and it allows us to, you know, the way the firmware works with the motor controller and the driver chips that I'm using on the board. You can very precisely set the rates uh, down to, um, you've got a, a granularity of down to like 1% uh, sidereal rate in incremental for tracking rate settings. And it'll slew all the way from that level all the way up to around 3 to 4 degrees per second. Uh, on the G11, the motors are mounted direct coupled. So that's a very wide range of motion precise motion that you get for the system. It's not servo, it's stepper motor. It's a stepper motor system. And so with the with the micro stepping driver chips we have now today, you're allow you basically go from one thirty second of a step all the way up to uh, the full range of, of four hundred steps. So you got that range of stepping, um, and with the with the way I've got it configured in the firmware, you go from basically one percent sidereal all the way up to uh, three to four degrees per second of a, of a step. A full step. Right, four hundred steps. steps of revolution, and this and the scaling on the G11 is four million. Uh, 680,000 steps per revolution all the way here. So it's basically 0.281 arc seconds per, s per micro step. Yeah. Well, it's not geared. It's just direct. Oh, the only gear is the worm in the wheel. So, yeah. So that's the resolution. So with the so it's basically for each revolution of the worm is 12,800 steps, micro steps per revolution of the worm. That's the kind of resolution we have. Um... So the other thing in the design is the, the thermal design. We've got, you know, this case serves a very important heat sink uh, design feature. And uh, the ground plane that's in the middle of the board and the, the center layer of the board serves as a heat sink. And the heat is uh, conducted out through these connectors up into the metal case. So it's very reliable thermally. Uh, that's got a conformal coating, and uh, so it can. And like I said, we've run it for at least uh, almost two years now in our observatory, from temperatures over 100 degrees down to well below freezing, and uh, it's been on basically the whole time. We've had the pr the processor or the controller turned on. It's always powered up, so it's never had a problem in that regard. Uh, so this this summarizes some of the thing. Uh, it's a clean sheet design from scratch, high re high reliability, high performance firmware design, uh, eight processors, and it's got a dedicated wireless communications processor. So the wireless is uh, 
it's a standard serial interface to the controller, but we use a Wi-Fi module um, to communicate Wi-Fi through the wireless, and um, and so it's got that processor also that's running on it. Um, Heavy-duty enclosure, high-reliable thermal design. Uh, and we've got the conformal coating on the board to to contain to manage the moisture. Um, Locking connectors on the uh, connectors so you can't yank a cable out. Um, <coughs> we got, <coughs> so the ASCOM driver is the first ASCOM driver that has wireless integrated into it. Typically, ASCOM only supports serial hardware cable, but I incorporated uh, the wireless uh, Wi-Fi driver into the ASCOM driver directly. So all you do is select the wireless and it'll directly send commands over the wireless network into the driver. Um, so there's no this there's no add-on modules or no add-on anything for for communicating through the wireless that type of thing. It's all integrated into the into the system. That's the, the box. That's what the board looks like. So that's the processor. Let me use my little laser thing. That's the processor. These are the driver chips for the two motors. And then you've got the regulators, the voltage regulators for the for the motors. You've got two other voltage regulators here, one for the logic, 3.3 volt, and then you've got a 5 volt. That's for the uh, communication serial, uh, the wireless board, actually. And so the wireless board on here is added on like a daughter board. I've got that, see this connector here? That So that board, that, that design, we made that so that we could change out this wireless board in the future. We could, we could design an Ethernet port board to tie it, uh, if, if we wanted to network it. We could do another, any, we could change out this, this module to another module for wireless. There's a lot of other inter interface options we can do with that. So that's why we did that design. Um, here's what the propeller, Parallax Propeller 8 processor microcontroller architecture looks like. Oh, let me. <laughs> I, I went ahead right, right away, didn't I? Oh. There we go. So. Those are the processors, and it, and it works in a round-robin fashion. So each processor has its own time to run during the cycle, and, it's, and the memory space is shared, and the I.O. space is shared. So any processor can access I.O., any I.O. Uh, uh, and the main I.O. we have is basically the motors, the driver chips. And so that's the architecture for the controller. And then here's the... Uh, Here's how the uh oops, keep doing it. Here's how the uh processor works, the whole um architecture of this platform. You've got the hardware down here with the different uh motors, and you got each of the processors run a task that talk to the motors or the or the communications. And then you've got the command language interpreter that talks to the driver either the driver that's in the Explore Stars app or in the ASCOM platform. And then above that, you've got your client, your ASCOM client programs or your applications. And that you can build that directly either to the platform or you can build applications that talk directly to the PMC-8 command language. So this is the kind of layered application system or system architecture that we have. Um, so we offer the the system on two mounts right now, the uh, Laws Mandy G11 that we sell, and then the Exos 2 mount uses the same box. Um, the G11 is direct drive off the motor, like I said, into the worm. The, the Exos 2 has a gear reduction system. It's a belt pulley system. It's not a spur gear system. It's very nice, very smooth. Um, and then uh, we've got another mount, that, like I said, that small mount's coming out, 
and uh, by the end of the year and then next year we'll probably be offering another mount that's a larger mount uh, that may be equivalent uh, to the G11 uh, we're still working on that uh, design so that's the G11 with the PMC8 um, I don't know if you can really see it. I didn't do a close-up on the motors, but the motors are here. You can see one here. They're direct coupled. Here's the XS2 like I had out here. And then uh, here's that new mount that's going to be around $400, which is really exciting. Um, here the board is mounted internal to the mount and the wiring for the RA axis is internal but the deck axis has got this cable and uh, you got you got this battery pack that comes with it and this is designed like this is a that's a 90 millimeter scope so we've got a Kickstarter going right now we wanted to see how we how to, how how many people were interested in this system. The Kickstarter is going to offer this mount as it is with the uh with the scope. We include a uh, um we actually include a little webcam also to get started in astrophotography. You can either use it as a video camera for doing planetary lunar or you can use it as a guide camera. Um mounted on the front because it comes with a lens and you can use it as a guide camera along with your and mount an SLR a digital SLR or some other camera on the back end of this and we're basically we're selling this package on the Kickstarter for $900 uh, but that's just that's basically the prototype for this system we're going to be selling this mount separate of course like our other mounts but I think Scott wanted to see how much interest there was in this type of turnkey system by offering it on the Kickstarter. Um, I'm sure we'll be bundling these type of systems in the future also uh, with other scopes and other, you know. This is the board that's in that uh, new mount. Uh, this is about a third of the size of this one. I've got one out here. If you, I've, Some of you have seen it already. Um, so this is actually that's the the wireless module there's the two motor drivers there's the internal connectors for the motors there's the regulators and on the back side of the board is the uh, is the processor now on this this original board it was just all the components were on one layer this one has a two layer on, on both sides all right so are there any questions about the hardware Yes, so you do. You have to use auto guiding to get down to two two arc second RMS tracking. Oh yeah, let me show you. Let me go back. Oh, what the heck? <laughs> this thing's really. <laughs> So this is the guide port. Yeah, so see this camera? Oh, okay. That's it right there. Does that not come with a, a fully scope, a built-in, or is that accessory? Is that an added accessory? Um, no, this doesn't have a polar scope. What you can do, what I guess what uh, Scott was thinking was that you would use this with maybe like Pole Master or something to do the guide, to do the alignment. Um, so I don't know if you could. I don't think you can fit a. Uh, I don't know, remember what the front of this thing. Although it does have this cover. See that little thing there? Yeah. I think that that may be a cover for the polar scope that would fit in there. I have to talk to them about that. 
Yeah, it's uh, 18 pounds is what we're thinking. So 102 is about the biggest thing you want. If you're going to do photography, yeah, because a 102 weighs what? 11, 10, 11 pounds maybe, I think. So if you put a digital SLR on there with the 102, you're going to be getting close to the limit. Um, but yeah, for beginning, it this this is meant, you know, as a teaching platform, not as a as a world class imaging system. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's really meant exactly to teach people how to do astrophotography and what's involved with it and so that's why we wanted to make it important to push down all the technology into this low end mount so you get a full blown view of all the software that would be involved with the observatory system all the all the setup all the you know all the things that are involved with software that would be involved with a full blown system you could you, you could train on this type of system so Right. So, right. So we sell a system right now called the Telescope Drive Master. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's a high resolution right ascension encoder that we use. We actually use it in our observatory. And I wanted to be able to design the hardware to support that functionality to be able to add on these uh, primarily a right ascension high resolution encoder. But you could do it on either axis, actually, or both. I mean, so both I'm axes. Working on an application that has high resolution, million count uh, uh, um, RAM jack and, and loose coupling in between the second motor drive and those axes. So this big clock refractor uh, just sits there. Oh. And it can spin, you know, it can spin up, uh, but the optical encoder will tell you where you really have Right, right. Right, well, that that system has servo motors on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, no, it oh, it is steppers? Right, yeah, that's right. Well, you want that for an observatory. So, yeah, so that's exactly why we, we like to be able to add that system on because of high high end use. Um, so, th yeah, this system is capable of, of that in the future. That's, that's part of the design philosophy going forward so that it has a long life cycle so that we can keep adding these features on and it has enough margin for performance that will handle all that. Uh, exact, th so that's correct. So the high-resolution encoder that we have in the Telescope Drive Master is actually um, it's 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 a 0.125 arc seconds per tick, so it's like around uh, eight million, ten million counts. Uh, it's very very high resolution, and it's a but it's a rate encoder, it's not a position encoder, which is a big difference, huh? Is a position, yeah. So that's a lot more expensive. So so. We're, we're so on the right ascension. What we're concerned with is making sure that the rate is accurate. So that's why we have have that system. So these would have rate encoders on it, and uh, you can always integrate the rate into into a position. You know the value uh, if you wanted to, but that's not a direct position measurement. It's just like feed. It's but uh, it, it's probably more accurate than the sepper count. Now. We get around problems. Now, this is an open loop system on our mounts, but we get around or we mitigate some of the problems with that on a stepper motor by managing the motor current so that you never have, uh, you know, exceed the uh, required, you, you, your available torque always ex uh, is, is exceed your required torque. So you never start this skipping steps or ratcheting or anything like that unless you're really out of balance. So we we try to manage that as much as we can, and it's worked pretty well. I mean, we get pretty in in our factory tests, the pointing a, um, accuracy is around one arc minute, full circle. So you can go anywhere. You can rotate 360 degrees, 
go back and forth and point anywhere. It's pretty darn linear too. So if you do a 360 degree, you can come back to within one arc minute. And we did this test. That's the statistical uh, measurement of that. So, um, and it was that way with the G11 and the Exos2 mount. We so we know that the design and the motor torques are set to in the factory. Theoretically, you can get that kind of performance, but it, of course, it relies on your alignment out in the field. You're, you got position error because of that, so you add that on top of what the uh, equipment will perform to. Um, but so in the in the observatory, for example, the G11, I can typically point to an object and get within five arc minutes, which you know our field of view on our camera is one degree or so, half, three quarters to one degree. And it's good enough. We do plate solves. Every time we go to an object, we do a plate solve. And then if we want to center it, we position it. So that's our, that's our normal process. And I think a lot of people do that. Uh, if you can get into multi-point modeling and all that other thing, you know, with applications if you want to and, and refine that. But basically out of the box, uh, standard polar alignment, you, can, you should be able to get pointing of around five arc minutes. Any other questions? All right, how are we doing for time? Okay. So the last thing I want to go over is the Open Go To community. This started. Um, this was Scott's idea from the beginning to make, and the, the basis for it is to be able to share our source code with anybody that wants to do development on the system. Um, we started. We started down that path. I've, like I said, I include the source code for the ASCOM driver in the install. I include, uh, we started the Yahoo group back uh, almost two years ago, year and a half at least. And, uh, and we moved to Groups IO recently. Um, so that got our customer base coming on and talking to me and, talk, and we talk our problems. We, you know, you got some growing pains the first year. You can see all that stuff on our Yahoo group. So you can go both to the Yahoo group and the groups IO and see the history of what's going on with the system. Also, I've done a lot of work or a lot of conversations on cloudy nights with people, people that are interested in buying it, and then also people, customers that have had problems or issues working through the system. Uh, this is a very, um, you know, since I'm an engineer, I, I probably, you know, that was the easiest for me to when out right at the bat to get technical documentation out and and get the thing working technically working you know <laughs> it, but you have to understand quite a bit of stuff it's not a uh, it's not a point and click camera type system where you, it is now but before when I first put when we first put it out it was a lot of things you had to do to understand how the system works because it's a little bit different than a standard hand controller in in that regards the explore stars app is uh, pretty innovative and so it's got some little tweaks and features that people weren't familiar with so we had to explain that and talk about it there's some there's some advanced uh tracking modes in the explore stars there's a point mode and a track mode and it's it's kind of an advanced mode it's 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 more like dynamic tracking so if you just plop the mount down and you do a three star alignment with explore stars it's basically dynamically calculating the rate on the fly for each axis to keep those object in the center of the field. So that's point mode. And then track mode is just standard gem tracking rate mode. And you can, like I said, you can adjust the rate anywhere you want uh, within reason as far as that goes. Um, so those are the kind of issues that we've worked with customers and wanted to share support with. And then uh, in the last a few months, six months or so, I beefed up the knowledge base. So I took all the questions from the first year that I got with emails, talking back and forth and on the forums, and I grouped them into, or basically boiled them down into a group of questions. There's 30 odd, probably 35 questions and answers on the uh, website on the knowledge base for the PMC8. And it that'll cover probably 90 to 95 percent of all the issues that people have run up against. So it's pretty mature now as far as customer support goes. Um, last year, the customer support rate, you know, every week I was talking to two or three customers. But it's tapered off quite a bit this, this past few months since I've gotten all this information out and people are familiar with it. So 
one of the first uh, knowledge base articles is about. I just got my, you know, I just got my Exos 2 mount. Where do I go for information? It's got a list of all the web you know, links and everything for all the documents, all the forums, everything that's involved with the PMC8 is there. There's a one-stop page to go and read all up about it. So uh, there is a certain level of knowledge that you should have when you start using the mount. The Explore Stars app is a beginning interface. Uh, it's got point and click for graphics. So you basically say, okay, as long as you can do alignment and you just, or, you know, physical or, or virtual, um, all you got to do then is just go to an object, say, I want to go to a solar system object. I want to go to Mars. And it brings up Mars with a bunch of information on Mars. And then you say go to, and it just does it. So one, basically two steps to go from the main ma main page to the object and go slew. No, that's directly. The Explore Stars it talks directly to the controller. It's it use, it's got the command. That's why we want to share that. That's another example of how you can use the command language for the controller directly with an application. Yeah, you can develop clients for the ASCOM driver just like you do today. Any client uh, that you want to develop to do anything you want, basically, you can connect through the ASCOM driver. Yep. Well, if you're familiar with the ASCOM API for mounts, you know, it gets into some astronomy related stuff, but it doesn't, but it, there's certain assumptions with ASCOM. One is that you're polar aligned. So there's no feature for doing a virtual alignment in ASCOM. Now, that doesn't mean that at the driver could not have that. I could add that feature. That's outside the, the platform. That's an ex like EQMod has a lot of features like that. If you're familiar with EQ mod, it's got multi-point uh, alignments and all kinds of stuff. So that stuff could be added to the ASCOM driver in the future. And that's really the point of making it open source. So people can say, oh, I want to I do alignments with my ASCOM driver. I don't want to have to do a physical alignment for some whatever reason. So they'll add that feature in there. There's other features that could be added, um, whatever. Right, right. So you have to learn how to do drift alignment. <laughs> that's what we we can't see Polaris at our observatory either. So, uh, so that's what this community is all about: is to be able to share that information. Um, so we created this open uh, go to community steering committee uh, last, uh, actually September fourth. We created the charter. And these are the main purposes of the steering community, to create the infrastructure necessary to implement the community and enable the com membership to enjoy the benefits of the infrastructure, which includes the social media platform, the, the source code repository, all that stuff. And then we, we want to make sure to, to disseminate complete and accurate information on the hardware and software that's available for the, for the PMC-8 system. And then finally, we're going to use this, we're going to leverage this in Explore Scientific to help support our customers. You know, so our philosophy there is we help the customers help themselves. So, and we've seen that on our Yahoo and, and Groups IO group where we actually have customers, you know, jumping in. You know, I always answered at the beginning, I had to answer questions. But now customers are jumping in and answering questions. And that's the kind of way you grow the community to get the customers helping themselves and discovering things and then and it helps bring up problems whatever problems are identified you know we can we can make sure they get fixed and then and then also we've actually had two or three developers already Michael Fulbright I don't know if any of you know him he developed the ND driver for the PMC8 under Linux so you can actually install K stars and the ND drivers on Linux and use the PMC8 system and develop whatever so that's available. Um, we've also got another uh, developer. His name's Chris Moses, who has built some utilities to help manage some of the functionality. Like, for example, one of the things we do, you have to switch between serial and Wi-Fi manually right now. He developed a little utility to just do that with the program. It makes it easier 
instead of having to do it manually through a telnet session and issue a PMC8 command. He's built a client for that, which is really nice. You know, so that's kind of where we're at right now with the community. Um, all right, so in summary, uh, the hardware is designed with reliability, built-in, high performance, and plenty of margin for future development. So the goal there is to have a long life cycle for this design and make it available uh, far into the future. Um, I'm thinking 20 years is reasonable. It very well could go longer than that. If it's owned by the world, as far as the platform goes, we'll keep selling the hardware as long as people want to develop and build stuff on the, on the software side, I imagine. Um, so we want a fully documented control system so, so everything is fully understood. Uh, there's no secrets about how it works or what, how it works, why it works. The only thing that's hidden is the schematic and the firmware. Everything else is available. Um, so the Open Go To community is, was created to share all this information with our users. Uh, that's that's the primary mission for that. And we're we're we like I said, the Open Go To community steering committee was created to formalize that type of work and to facilitate building the infrastructure to do that work. Um, and then the bottom line is this architecture allows you to create applications fast and easy based on its simplified command language and also its availability for the software uh, source code. And then, uh, and then you, can, you can do your own, you could build a robot, two-axis robot arm with this thing in the classroom and, you know, very easily, you know. So that's that's kind of what the reason reason for this system. So there's my contact information if you want to write that down, and then there's the groups.io to get. So I would suggest go there first <coughs> if you want to get involved with the community. You can go to our Explore Scientific website, Explore Scientific USA, and click on PMC8 uh, under. Uh, there's a couple ways to get to it, but if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see the knowledge base and find it. But you can also click on mounts up at the top and look at the PMC-8 mount systems, and you'll find the links to all the stuff. Uh, and that's, that's about all I have. Any more questions? <coughs>